Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's histology course lecture on the immune system. In part one of this lecture series, we're going to look at diffuse and unencapsulated structures associated with the immune system. As with all of these lectures, please review the objectives uh, that are provided because it'll give you an idea uh, what are the important concepts uh, associated with this topic, as well as providing you with uh, a sample of study focusing questions. Now, if we take a look at the lymphatic organization, essentially the organizational lymphatic system, what we're going to see is primarily going to be structures within the body involved with an immune system response, uh, involved with essentially protecting the body from uh, foreign materials and pathogenic uh, materials from getting into the body and establishing themselves and causing uh, a disease state. And this can range from diffuse lymphatic tissues, which are going to be scattered tissues that are just found kind of throughout uh, the body in a variety of locations. We can have unencapsulated aggregates, which are distinct kind of clusters of uh, lymphatic cells and lymphatic tissues without a lot of kind of connective tissue, a lot of, without a lot of kind of external structure associated with them. So they don't, you know, they're unencapsulated, so they don't have a, an outer boundary in essence, but they're still an aggregate, they're accumulation of these cells and tissues. And then finally, we're going to have uh, some lymphatic organs, so some distinct structures, uh, both anatomically and, anatomically and physiologically, so both structure and function, for um, specific uh, regions of the body, for specific uh, protective mechanisms, and these are going to be the lymph node, the spleen, and the thymus. Okay, so to start out with, we want to identify what are the primary cells associated with uh, the lymphatic system and with the immune system, in essence. And the majority of cells that we're going to see in the body that are going to be involved with mounting this protective response, this immune system response uh, to foreign materials, pathogenic materials, are going to be lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are going to be a category of white blood cells. And in most cases, what you're going to find within the body, and the image on the right-hand side is actually looking at a, a blood smear, but it's a good way of seeing an isolated uh, lymphocyte, is going to be a small lymphocyte, uh, essentially a cell that is circulating through the body or located in the body someplace, but it's capable of mounting a response to a specific type of foreign pathogen, to a specific type of foreign molecule uh, or or foreign uh, disease-causing entity. And so it's going to start out with this kind of relatively small presence. It's going to be essentially pretty much just the nucleus, and it's going to have a fairly heterochromatic nucleus because it's going to be an inactive cell. And it's not going to have a lot of cytoplasm around it. Again, it's just kind of basically migrating through the body looking for what it can mount a response to. And so it's essentially almost like a resting cell. You know, it's just doing the minimum in order to stay alive as it migrates through the body. Now, under most circumstances, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between the two types of lymphocytes, but uh, with special staining or uh, specific locations in the body, we can identify cells as either being B cells, B lymphocytes, which are going to be involved with the production of the protein antibodies, which are going to flag foreign materials as, as being foreign and should be eliminated from the body or T cells, and T cells are involved with cell-mediated immunity. So instead of producing antibodies that are released and direct the activity of other cells, T cells essentially go through and do the protective mechanism on them. They're going to be going through and essentially killing uh, pathogenic cells. They're going to be going through and interacting directly with this foreign disease-causing entity. In addition to the lymphocytes, we're going to have some antigen-presenting cells. And we've talked about antigen-presenting cells a little bit already in this course. But they're basically going to be cells that, again, are going through the body or, uh, or some location in the body. They're going to phagocytize material, so they're essentially gobbling up things around them. Uh, they're going to be involved with essentially cleaning up debris, cleaning up materials. Uh, but they don't completely digest these things. The antigen-presenting cells don't digest things completely. They're going to take some of those protein remnants, some of these shapes, and put them on their surface to present them to other cells. And the way they're going to do this is they're going to take that protein shape, which is a potential antigen, and put it on their surface in close proximity, essentially combining it with histocompatibility complex proteins. And they show that around. 
to other cells. They're going to show that to other types of lymphocytes and say, basically, I found this. Is this interesting? And if the lymphocyte is able to mount a response to it, it becomes activated. And so these antigen-presenting cells are going to present the antigen or potential antigen to a wide range of lymphocytes and hopefully trigger an immune response if there is a foreign material present. And then finally, we've got the macrophages, again, a cell that we've talked about a lot within the course. Uh, the macrophages have some antigen presenting uh, capabilities, so they can gobble things up and still present them along their surface, uh, but they're going to be a primarily a phagocytic cell. They're going to be going through and gobbling up debris. They're going to be gobbling up damaged regions of the body. They're going to be going through and uh, attacking the areas that have been flagged with an antibody as being a foreign material. And so they're going to be uh, pretty much an indiscriminate cell that's going through and essentially responding to the activity of other cells within the immune system. Now when we take these cells and then put them into the body, the first way we can find these cells is kind of scattered throughout uh, various regions, normally scattered within the lamina propria, that loose connective tissue that's found underneath the epithelia of the skin or underneath the epithelia of the small intestine. Again, because the skin is an outer surface of the body or the small intestine where we're going to have, you know, essentially the, the digestive tract in essence, it's going to be up against what is pathologically uh, the external regions of the body. And it's easy to see that in the skin. Underneath the skin is exposed to the outer kind of the outer world, the surrounding regions of the body. The digestive system is essentially taking foreign material, taking food particles, putting it in our mouth, dragging it through uh, a series of tubular organs. We'll talk about them in greater detail in the next series of lectures. But it's physiologically and pathologically the equivalent of the outside world. But instead of having the nice strata, uh, maximally uh, keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, that nice boundary around the outside of the body, when we start looking at the digestive tract, we've got uh, a very simple epithelium, one cell layer thick, and it's going to be especially susceptible to potential invasion of foreign materials and pathogen uh, cause pathogenic uh, uh, entities, essentially uh, bacteria or things that can cause disease. And so we're going to have these diffuse lymphatic tissues, which in essence are just going to be collections of lymphocytes. So these small lymphocytes that we've talked about before are going to be migrating through the region and they have a tendency to be where they're needed. They're going to be at locations where it's likely that we're going to have foreign material or pathogenic materials getting into the body. And so we'll find lots of these cells, again, uh, relatively basophilic appearance because you've got a heterochromatic nucleus and not a lot of cytoplasm around it. And so if you see a lot of basophilic staining, a lot of small cells packed in, you should start thinking about this as being these lymphocytes and looking at a diffuse lymphatic tissue. Now areas where we have an infection are going to have a large number of these lymphocytes. And we're actually looking at a little bit of an infection in this slide. And we can see this nice area, you know, nice in terms of an infection, uh, but the immune system is responding to it. So we can see kind of running down through the center of this image, lots of very small cells, basophilic cells, which are going to have uh, a lot of lymphocytes that have been drawn to this region because there's a, a potential infection going on. In this case, there is an infection. And they're going to that region to see if they can help out, to see if they're the type of cell that can produce an antibody to that specific foreign material. So we're going to have a lot of small lymphocytes in this area. If we look at higher magnification, we may be able to see some of the plasma cells we've talked about previously, which are actually activated B lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes that are going to be producing the antibody. And the plasma cells are activated and in the process of synthesizing and secreting antibodies to flag for materials, pathogenic materials. Now, the next structure we can take a look at a little bit more organization are going to be the lymph nodules. And the lymph nodules are going to be circular aggregates of lymphatic tissues. And it's essentially going to be circular aggregates of these B lymphocytes. And so you're going to look at it and you're going to again see this circular profile. It's going to be almost like ball in a, a three-dimensional structure where it's going to be packed with these small lymphocytes. Again, very basophilic staining appearance because you've got heterochromatic nuclei, not a lot of cytoplasm, and a lot of cells packed in there. So this evenly dark connection of small lymphocytes. And in most cases, you're going to have a primary nodule. And a primary nodule is going to be this kind of circular aggregate of these small lymphocytes. So it's going to be a round aggregate of very basophilic, very small cells. 
Now, if you've got cells that become activated, again, what's going to happen is these small lymphocytes are going to go from that resting stage to the point where they're going to be producing antibodies. And so at that point, we're going to see the cells get larger. And so the nucleus, which was heterochromatic, essentially inactive, uh, packed together DNA, is going to become active. And so it's going to open up. It's going to become more euchromatic. It's going to become lighter staining. We're going to have more cytoplasm that's going to be present because we're going to have to turn on the machinery for producing antibodies. So we're going to be synthesizing and secreting antibodies. And so it's still going to be basophilic, but it's going to be kind of a lighter basophilic staining. And so because of that, we're going to have these larger cells, these plasma cells, that are going to be present there. Many of them are going to divide, so we've got lots of these plasma cells that are all going to be able to produce uh, antibodies. And so what we're going to have is going to be, at that point, a secondary nodule, essentially a lymphocyte region lymph, um, where the lymphocytes have been activated and are mounting a response. And so within the secondary nodule, we're going to have what's referred to as the germinal center, kind of in two on that diagram on the image to the right, kind of that central region, that lighter staining region, where we're going to have active lymphocytes, larger cells, more euchromatic uh, nucleus, involved with producing antibodies. The mantle zone around the outside is going to be that darker boundary. And that's, again, like we would see in a primary nodule, uh, kind of packed in small lymphocytes very close to one another. Now, lymph nodules are going to be found at a variety of locations within the body, again, that are potentially susceptible to foreign materials getting in and becoming established. So we can find them in the tonsils as essentially a ring around the entrance to the digestive system at the back of the oral cavity. Pyres patches, which are going to be lymph nodules found within the small intestine. We can find lymph nodules in the outer cortex of the lymph node as, in, as part of that filtration mechanism uh, with the lymphatic circulatory system. And we'll also find lymph nodules in the white pulp of the spleen. And we'll talk both about the lymph node and the spleen in the next lecture in this series. Again, if we take a look at the tonsils, they're incompletely encapsulated lymphoid aggregates. They're basically these lymph nodules that are found at the back of the oral cavity. And so it's often described as Waldeyer's uh, tonsillar ring. Because again, if you think about it, the oral cavity as the opening to the external world is going to be the first thing that's exposed to potentially disease-causing materials that are being brought into the digestive system. And so the presence of the tonsils in this location means that as you're bringing food materials in, as you're starting to chew them up, start to break them apart, you're going to dissolve potentially bacteria uh, within this a saliva. It can get into that region. It can potentially get into the epithelia and become established. The fact that we have these lymphoid cells in this area means that we can kind of jumpstart the immune system response because they're going to be in the location where they're going to see that firsthand. Both the pharyngeal and lingual tonsils uh, are going to be found in this area. Uh, pharyngeal tonsils are essentially lymph nodules that are covered by partly by the respiratory epithelium, partly by the minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Lingual tonsils uh, are going to be characterized by the covering of a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, but they may have a crypt associated with them. So a location where, in essence, the saliva with the materials in it can be drawn down into the region where we've got these lymph nodules. The palatine tonsils uh, are going to be, again, covered by a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, but they're going to have numerous deep epithelial invagination, deep crypts, which are essentially going to draw in that uh, saliva, draw in the, the food materials within the mouth into this region where they can, in essence, be sampled by antigen-presenting cells and the lymphocytes uh, within the lymph nodules within the tonsils. Pyres patches, as we said, are going to be lymph nodules that are going to be sitting within the small intestine. So underneath uh, the epithelium of the small intestine, they're underlying some specialized epithelial cells. They're called M cells, which are going to be an example of an antigen-presenting cell. So again, sampling what's passing through the lumen of the small intestine and then projecting through a long cellular process down into the lymph nodule so they can essentially present these materials to the cells and say, hey, this is what I found out there in the lumen. Is this good or is this bad? Is this is something that's foreign? Is it unknown? Is it something that could be causing a disease process? And that's going to finish up our first mini lecture on the immune system. I'll come back and we'll talk about the encapsulated organs in part two of this series. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.